I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, I met up with Lendert Vandenbos, the CEO of Enzitag, and Rodney Lax, a peptide expert with decades of experience in industry. We discussed the science behind chemoenzymatic peptide synthesis, or SEPS technology, and its growing impact on the discovery and manufacturing of peptides. Well, um, maybe we could start, uh, Linda, I'd love to know more about your scientific background. You know, how did you get to where you are now? So I, uh, I have a PhD in bioorganic chemistry from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, my thesis was focused on um, carbohydrate chemistry and designing synthetic routes towards biologically active carbohydrates. After that, I joined Organon, um, and that became later Shearing Plow, that became later Merck Sharp and Dome, uh, and lastly, Aspen Pharmacare. I was mostly active in the process R&D department uh, in those companies. And in 2018, I joined um, Enzitech. December 2018, I joined Enzitech, co-founded Enzitech uh, to work on uh, yeah, further developing the, the peptide ligase technology, which is a topic of this, uh, of this interview. Excellent. And Rodney, how about you? I don't know that we've ever talked about your background. My long past. <laughs> uh, yes, I studied biochemistry in Birmingham in the UK and in London. And then I left for one to two year postdoc in Germany, first in Ulm and then in, uh, then in Essen. Uh, that two years turned into 33 years. Um, during that time, I left academia uh, where I'd been a steroid biochemist and joined a small uh, biotech in, near Hanover, which was working with peptides. And they were actually working with Buckham USA at the time. And that is how I sort of slipped in to the peptide business. And then around 1996, Buckham Switzerland uh, acquired Buckham USA. Um, and at that time, um, after a brief spell um, independently, I joined the Polypeptide Laboratories Group, first in Europe and then moved across the USA in 2003. 2014, I got involved with uh, NCPEP when I met the founder, Peter van Tilburg, at a scientific meeting. And I joined them as a scientific advisor and as a consultant. And then after NCPEP was acquired and NCTAG uh, was established, I stayed with NCTAG, uh, basically doing the same job I'd been doing at NCPEP. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I appreciate the clarification <laughs> of the NZ tag, NZ pep story. Uh, so, uh, Linda, maybe you could, um, you know, you brought up the, the, the topic, obviously, of this interview is going to be around the peptolygase. Maybe you can just give a summary of the technology um, and what NZ tag is offering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's an enzyme. It's what the name says. It's an enzyme that is able to ligate peptide fragments together. Uh, and I think it's very important to stress that one piece of the, 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 the components you ligate together should has to be synthetic in nature because the, the, um, the enzyme recognizes an oxoester moiety that is synthesized in that peptide uh, fragment. Um, the enzyme itself may be a bit more focused on that. So that is uh, derived from uh, subtilisin. It's an engineered subtilisin, and it basically joins um, or merges two tricks. Uh, one trick is that the serine in the active site of the enzyme is replaced for a cysteine. And by replacing the serine for a cysteine, it loses its hydrolytic activity and it gets exclusive ligating properties. So all hydrolytic activity is gone in that enzyme. And the second um, invention is that the, um, the backbone of the enzyme is stabilized. So some um, amino acids in the backbone are exchanged for others, and that add, adds stability to the, uh, to the enzyme. That is essentially what the technology does, um, or what the enzyme is. And then, so when you feed your synthetic um, fragments, so your synthetic ester, oxoester, to the enzyme, the oxoester reacts with the cysteine in the active site, 
then you feed um, amine fragment to the solution and the enzyme ligates the two peptide fragments together. You get an amide bond covalently attached. And so it's, it's, it's essentially without any footprint or without any scar, the enzyme ligates the two peptide fragments together and generates a larger peptide molecule. And the um, synthetic fragment that has the oxoester at the C terminus, does that end terminal portion have to be protected so that you don't get uh, you know, coupling of that fragment to itself? Yes, routinely we protect the end terminal of the ester fragment in order to prevent um, di uh, dimerization or cyclization. Uh, some amino acids are not recognized by the enzyme, like proline. Uh, so when, when there is a proline at the end terminal of the ester fragment, no protection is required indeed. And what types of protecting groups do you use? Do you use things that can be easily cleaved um, to leave sort of like, a, I guess, a traceless protecting group? So that depends uh, very much on the solubility of the fragment uh, that you're synthesizing. So peptide synthesis or peptide science is, is, is largely about solubility of the, of the fragments you synthesize. Uh, but FMOC could be used in case you have a well-soluble fragment, you could use FMOC, uh, or in case it's less soluble, you could use the SMOC, DDE, um, um, or admin degradation, like placing a proline at the very end terminal and then do an admin degradation is also a possibility. So there's, not, there's no one very good protective group, but we have various uh, protective groups that we use. So yeah, I think, sorry, uh, I think you should also, also mention that, you know, um, by the use of selective enzymes, you, you can actually avoid using a protecting group in many cases. But typically when we start a project, we would use a protecting group because it's just easier to use a, an, a, a ligase which will virtually ligate any particular peptides with each other. But as we move forward, we can try and design enzymes which do not recognize, uh, which will not recognize the end terminal of a particular fragment. Yeah, so yeah, as you're working with companies, I guess it would be a scale issue of, a, of when you would move to a specific enzyme. Well, you try and avoid it. You try and avoid an extra synthetic step. Yeah, I mean, it, it would it ends up with a uh, it ends up as giving us a more economical process. Right, right. When I met you, then, so I'm wondering, um, you know, when you start out, I guess, what's the workflow? So a company comes to you and says, "I want to make this, you know, this protein," uh, and you say, "Okay, well, we're going to, you know, go from here." So maybe, Lander, can you walk through that process? Yes, so the customer comes to us and wants to have to test our technology on their compound. What we then typically do is we take our workhorse enzyme, which is called Omniligase, that has the broadest specificity. We know its properties the best, um, and we have a look at the sequence and identify the ligation points, the suitable ligation points uh, with our technology. Uh, we then synthesize the fragments, we treat them with omniligase and show that it indeed works. A subsequent step could be, provided that the volumes of the compound are large enough, that we do enzyme engineering and further optimize the enzyme to recognize the specific amino acid sequence at the ester part and the amine part um, in order to further improve the yield. That would then result in a uh, selective which we then call peptiligase for ligating the peptide fragments together. And that is essentially what we offer. We then write a report, give it back to the customer, and they do then uh, yeah, take, they take care of the upscale uh, under GMP. Uh, something else that you mentioned was solubility of the synthetic fragments. So I know, I mean, enzymes are, you think, water reactions. And I know that you can have a certain amount of organic solvent. Um, so maybe you talk a little bit about that, but then also, are there other ways to circumvent solubility issues with the synthetic fragments? Um, yes. Um, so you so to start with the last, um, you can certainly uh, um, improve the solubility of the, the the peptide fragment, especially of the ester fragment, by placing a solubility tag C terminal of the oxoester. So the part that is clipped off during the enzymatic ligation, you can, for example, 
uh, place four lysines or four glutamic acids in order to improve or change the PI such that it is soluble under the ligation conditions, which are typically uh, between pH 7 and pH 8.5. Um, so that's one trick for the amine fragment that is, of course, incorporated as such in the peptide sequence. So there you need to work with cleavable solubility tags, which is a bit more difficult, but you can, of course, use the, the helping hands that are uh, published in, in literature. Um, so, so that is possible. Um, organic solvents, so the, the first part of your question is, is also possible. So the enzyme is stable in some 10% acetonitrile or DMF. You can even use yeah, DMSO, but that's more difficult to remove uh, from, the, from the reaction afterwards. Uh, and chaotropic agents are also uh, allowed. So guanidinium chloride uh, or um, uh, urea are allowed to improve the solubility of the fragments. And so the reactions typically are these done in batch mode or flow, or is there is there a time when you would want to switch over? Can you are you even in a, a, a system where you can do flow um, ligation? So we focus mostly on on batch mode uh, these days uh, because that is most that is the standard in industry right now still, but it is changing. Uh, and so we have also tried already um, how we could adapt the process um, such that uh, you could make it flow. You could do the, the reaction in flow. And for that, we have immobilized the enzyme uh, and investigated the, the stability and the activity of the enzyme. And it retains its activity once it is immobilized. Uh, and you could even... Um, 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 recycle it a couple of times. Uh, so it's not like endless, but uh, some five times have been tested now in the lab and they work. Does immobilization have any impact on the kinetics of the enzyme or I mean, is it? Immobilization is, is, uh, yeah, is quite remote from the active site. So it has limited um, um, impact on the activity, certainly not in the first couple of cycles. So when you get more cycles, yeah. So your enzyme denatures a bit uh, each and every cycle. So then you do see an impact on the activity. And can, sorry, I, I'm getting stuck on this immobilization just because I, sure. I find it you know, very interesting to be able to flow through. I guess maybe we could talk a little bit about why batch is the standard in industry and does it make sense to go to flow or what are the challenges that, that are currently faced by doing large scale um, enzymatic ligations? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and not sure if I have um, th the answer right now. So what I that there is enough capacity in the world to run batch productions. So and that is already paid for. So it, it's it is very cheap and continuous flow where well, you need to build a factory that is requires capital. Uh, and so that increases the cost of the API that you produce. Um, furthermore, for flow chemistry, um, you need to have a kinetic problem. So like when you have a very exothermic reaction, flow could help because then you decrease your reaction volume and yeah, miniaturization helps. With enzyme kinetics, I'm not, I don't see the kinetic problem right now. Maybe Rodney can, can um, shed his light on it, but Flow is helpful because you miniaturize, but I don't know whether you really solve a, a, a problem with changing to flow. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for many of the processes we've looked at, and these I'm talking about uh, making longer peptides rather than making proteins, I mean, uh, you, the relationship between the starting reagents and the enzyme is like one to a thousand. So you need very, very little enzyme. And typically we say, if you've got a, a gram of the enzyme, you can make a kilogram of the product. And there are very few peptides where there are batch processes which are much larger than 10 or 20 kilograms at the most. So, and this is all done in a reactor, which just needs a pH control and a stirrer. So it's very easy to use batch chemistry. The one thing which flow would, where it would give you a real advantage is on the use of the enzyme. 
because um, particularly as we immobilize the enzyme and we can make more stable uh, immobilized enzymes and you can use them then for making much, much larger um, amounts of material, then you reduce the cost of the enzyme. Now, right now, at a 1 to 1,000 uh, ratio, the enzyme doesn't really cost very much at all. I mean, you're not even adding a dollar to the price of a gram to do that. But some of the processes do need more enzyme. And that's where perhaps making the enzyme does become a cost point. And that's where I think immobilization and the flow process will help. But this really has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so what do you think the biggest challenges um, have been to get the adoption of the enzyme in processes? Conservatism, I think. I, I, I think people, uh, I mean, we have to, of course, you have to realize most GMP processes, you can't really start modifying them. I mean, once you've got past late phase one, phase one, late phase two, nobody wants to change a process because it's very expensive. And certainly if you have an approved product, changing the process means re-registration in every country where it's registered. You're talking about millions of dollars to introduce a new process. So the real challenge is to persuade uh, people to start using this pretty early on and to carry on using it through the production because other we have like two windows and the one the first window is like the discovery up to early process development phase one phase two and then you have like eight years when you have to wait till you get through to approval then post approval and um, if you've got a blockbuster then of course you're going to look at different processes for making your product. But in that in-between time, um, it's very, very difficult to change. There have to be really good reasons for doing that. And then, you know, people don't like changing winning horses, but winning horses eventually die. So, you know, eventually, and we see that, I mean, obviously we have a lot more knowledge about what's going on in the GMP world uh, with these enzymes than we can actually put out in the public domain. It's coming, but it's taking time. And it's, it's mainly due to the fact that people don't want to change methods that they, they know work, um, even if they're not that green and maybe slightly more expensive. Sure. Leonard, I don't know whether you want to say any more to that. No, yeah, well, it, it, it relates to the technology adaptation curve. Not sure if you are aware of that curve where you have the early adopters, then you have a chasm, and then you have the, the late adopters and uh, ultimately the, the laggards. So the, the early adopters is about 20% of the, of the population you talk mm -hmm. about, and the, and the other 80% is uh, past the chasm. So you first need to have them cross the, the chasm in order to, to, um, yeah. to take up the technology. Uh, and I think that's what we try to do with staying as close as possible to, uh, to the potential customer or to the customer, guide them through their work. So really understand what, what they want to do, what compounds they want to make or what compound they want to produce at scale. Yes. And then see uh, where the where we could use our technology to 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 put the technology in its strength and in that way also uh, serve the need uh, of the customer. And I fully agree with Rodney that we need to start as early as possible with the customer. Um, so and also for that reason, Enzipat had kits available where customers could simply order the kit. Uh, and then they get a, a small quantity of omni ligase, so the most powerful enzyme we have, together with some uh, test peptides, so that they could run uh, the ligations themselves and know how yeah, how to handle and how to use them or get acquainted with it. And that is also what we um, have now set up again. So as of today, uh, our website has been updated with this ordering tool um, and so that, that that pharma companies and biotech companies could order uh, these kits from our website and test the enzyme uh, themselves in their laboratories and then work with us on solving their needs, uh, their ligation needs. Yeah, I think one thing which actually is quite important to mention, because when we're having this discussion, we're really talking about molecules which can be made by perhaps several different methods, but there are some unique uh, 
uh, uses for these enzymes. For example, if you wanted to make a small protein which contains non-canonical amino acids, um, you can't really you can't really do that using recombinant technology, and it gets quite difficult to you know do this synthetically. So the idea of take you know making a medium-sized peptide which contains a number of different uh, exotic amino acids and coupling it to say a, a another peptide or a recombinant truncated protein is something you can't do with other technologies very easily and it's very easy uh, with the peptide ligases so that you know there are some unique applications there where you really have to use this type of technology or you just can't do it mm -hmm. I mean, one of the criticisms we used to hear, certainly at the start, is, well, you know, there aren't many molecules between, say, many peptide, polypeptides between 50 amino acids and 250 that we really want to look at. But the, the, one of the reasons why we don't look at these molecules, particularly substituted ones, is because there's no way of making them. So um, this is a technology which allows you to experiment um, in that area uh, and look whether these molecules have uh, a pharmaceutical potential. Along those lines, I mean, I think that that's sort of um, empowering innovation, right? Giving people yeah. the tools so that they can come up with the, these new molecules and entities. What are on the, uh, you know, fragments that you're utilizing, what are the limitations? Um, you know, mostly we've been talking about like linear peptides, right? But yeah. where, what else can these um, enzymes be utilized for? Well, I mean, the, the actual ligation uh, sequence or motive is four amino acids on the end of the ester fragment and two uh, on, the, on the end terminal of the amino fragment. Anything which is sort of like left of right of that doesn't really influence the enzymatic reaction. I mean, as long as it doesn't make the molecule insoluble or anything like that. So you could you could have a peg on there, you could have lipids on there, you could have carbohydrates on there. There's nothing really limiting what you put oh on God. outside that actual six amino acid ligation sequence, four at the yeah. ester, two at the amino end. So you can do that. And, and one of the things which hasn't been mentioned yet up to this point in this discussion, uh, these enzymes are very good at making uh, cyclic peptides. So any peptides which are cyclic and longer than, say, 13 amino acids, um, it's very easy to develop efficient processes using enzymes, much more efficient than using chemical processes. I think one, one item to add here is that um, uh, accessibility of the N-terminus uh, is important. So only two amino acids are required for recognition, but in case that whole N-terminus is buried in the body of a peptide or protein and cannot yeah. be accessed by the enzyme, yeah. that is something people should, should, uh, yeah. and, uh, should be aware of. One of the approaches of. to that is if you have a synthetic uh, protein, not synthetic, but if you have a protein which uh, where the N-terminal is not freely available, you can uh, recombinantly add a tag to that. You can make the yeah. protein longer. And so typically putting on another eight amino acids, say a six amino acid spacer, and, and then the two amino acid linker for the enzyme is usually sufficient to uh, be able to conjugate another molecule to the, to the protein. So then are these also, these peptide ligases compatible with some of the display technologies? Uh, yes. Uh, so, and that, that will be, uh, that, that's very nice also to, um, to mention. Thanks for asking, because uh, recently we um, published a paper together with uh, Danny Chu's lab in uh, Stanford, hmm. um, uh, where he tests, tested the um, um, coupling of insulin to a phage displayed sequence. Um, so I think it's good to also make a reference to that um, uh, where yeah, people can, uh, can look more into the details of, uh, of, of how that is done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can absolutely make that reference available in the description so that, that folks can read it. Um, yeah. So some of the other um, you know, areas I think that I kind of wanted to touch on, and this sort of takes the conversation a little bit back, but what do you think was the big breakthrough for getting this technology kind of off the ground? 
Yeah, so um, um, the, um, it's, 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 it's two ways. The, the first one is that uh, replacing the serine for the cysteine and still keeping activity in the enzyme is, of course, quite a breakthrough. That was already known, I think, uh, well, in the, in the last century, I think in the 80s of the last century. Um, and then uh, the, the stabilizing mutations uh, in the enzyme that still results in an active enzyme is, of course, another breakthrough. But in the NZPEP, NZTAG um, timeframe, so like starting in 2012 until now, uh, NZPEP focused very much on the on organic concept by um, replacing peptide coupling agents and yeah, just um, uh, coupling single amino acids uh, to a growing chain of, of peptides. That was uh, abandoned, and they then focused on the aqueous concept yeah. by coupling larger fragments together. I think that was that was a major shift, uh, which was very successful in the end. Um, and in addition to that, uh, they um, <clears throat> they also developed the hydrolase trick uh, to identify the ligation sites, and that means that you treat the target peptide with the hydrolase, and then basically let nature guide you to the most ideal ligation site, not only taking into account the sequence of the peptide, but also the secondary structure of the target. Uh, so, and that gives uh, an excellent fit with where the protease cleaves versus where the ligases ligates. Uh, and yeah, that, 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 that's-, yeah, that's These different. are actually paired hydrolases and ligases. So yeah. what we've done is, over several uh, generations of variants, we have a very selective uh, ligase. And then by switching back to serine at the active site, we get a very selective hydrolase. So we can use the very selective hydrolase to cut a protein up into several pieces. And that's telling us exactly where the ligase is going to put it back together again. You can use an algorithm to do this as well, but the algorithm is not as good as using the hydrolase because the algorithm doesn't see the secondary structure of the molecule. You know. So for the you know, breakthrough technologies like this, and sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, but uh, it's just an, an interesting topic. Um, I was speaking with it, I actually set this whole interview up um, because I was talking to Tina Bovel and Andrew Buller mm -hmm about biocatalysis and the formation of new amino acids and how do you get that adopted into the chemistry lab? Because we were talking a moment ago that, yeah, there's a challenge on, on the scale when you're looking at manufacturing, but there's the other component where if we can get chemists at the bench to understand the technology and feel comfortable with it, then they'll utilize it so it's already in sort of the pipeline of synthesis, the, the strategy of synthesis. So what do you think, you know, we have the kits, well, sorry, Enzotag has the kits to put into the lab, but how do you get the chemist comfortable using enzymes? Let it yeah, so, yeah, 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 no, well, yes, 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 please. So um, take them by their hand and explain them that um, enzymes, so what are the, the, the unique um, chemical characteristics you need to watch when doing a enzymatic reaction. So it's not, uh, it's not an organic solvent. Uh, you can't just run a TLC and see how your conversion goes. So you just have, it, it's all molecules, but different jargon. So you need to watch the pH, you need to watch the concentration of the reaction components, the, the buffer composition. Um, and, and, and those are just slightly yeah. different uh, parameters a chemist should focus yeah. at. And I think that is something you should tell them. For biologists, it is um, a bit different because they are used to, to working with aqueous solutions, but they are not so much used working with crude peptides, for example, that, has, that have the TFA salt still in, uh, and that they should just compensate uh, the buffer uh, uh, to accommodate mm -hmm. the, the, the additional salts. So yeah. th those are typical aspects. Take, it, take them by their hands, explain them to, to yeah, in very detailed, um, fashion, how to do it, and uh, and how to work. Yeah, the main problem we had, because we started doing this with the kits at NCPAP, the uh, main problem was pH, because people just didn't realize that uh, the pH of the 
peptides they were putting into the solution were actually preventing the enzyme from work. And there's perhaps one other thing also for chemists, and because chemists don't usually work with aqueous solution, and aqueous solution get contaminated really very quickly with proteases, which come from all sorts of places. Now, I know it was a big surprise for me years and years ago before I had anything to do with, uh, with Enzipep, but uh, people telling me, you know, that the, even the enzymes on your fingertips, if you don't use plastic gloves to put your... Uh, pipette tips on your Eppendorf pipettes, those enzymes, proteases, are going to let, end up in your proteins solution and it's going to, to cut everything to pieces. And, and that happens and people don't really think about that. You know, you're thinking about enzymes as being something in a biological system or in a bottle, but they don't think about the fact that they, they're carrying all these proteases around with them. So, it, 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 you know, you, have, you get into that middle ground between chemistry and biology. You have to have a little bit of understanding for the, the biologics of the situation at the same time you have to know something about the chemistry. But um, as Leonard said, um, you know, if there are any doubts, any questions, however stupid they might seem, just give us call or send us a mail and um, we'll try and clarify that for you. We really do want to help people and guide people through this because we really believe in this technology. And, and these days, many, many pharma and biotech companies have a biological department in whatever form. Mm -hmm. So where they are used to working with enzymes or sensitive substrates mm -hmm. in the eyes of, the, of a chemist. So they could also um, ask their colleagues then to for a further assistance. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it, I was gonna ask if there was sort of, um, yeah, the laboratory profile that you've had the most success with. Is it, you know, the lab that's like small, where you're the biologist and the chemist are in constant communication, or is there? A... Uh, it's mostly with pharma companies that do have um, quite a bit of activities in, in biochemistry. Yeah. So they are not really hardcore small molecule labs that we work the most mm -hmm. with. Uh, but it is kind of already the ones that are already focusing on beyond the rule of five molecules. So like, they are already working on a routine basis with um, recombinantly expressed proteins. So yeah, that, that are the ones that, uh, that we work the most with and that we know that they are experienced. So something else that had been brought up uh, was the, the green aspect of using enzymes. I mean, that's something yeah. that's come up in several of the interviews that I've done, is really trying to, to get people to understand and adopt the culture of the greening of um, peptide and, and you know, now even longer, you know, small protein science. So what do you find when you're speaking with different companies or different customers? Um, are they very open to the green aspect? Is it something that they find important? I think it's something that everybody believes is important, whether they are actually prepared to make the effort and change or not, you know, that is, 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 is something else. But I, I think there is throughout the pharmaceutical industry, there is definitely this commitment to use greener, uh, greener chemistry or greener processes to, to get the final products. But as I said, you know, it goes back to the situation. It's very difficult to change a process once it's, once it's off the ground. And yeah. this idea is, okay, we'll, you know, we'll do this at small scale, uh, early development, we'll do it like this, and then we'll change somewhere along the line. Before you know it, you know, the train has left the station and people say, no, we're not changing anything. So, um, yeah, but I mean, the green aspect is really important. I mean, even the, just using fragments rather than using, doing step-by-step -step, uh, straight through f chemistry is going to solve your, save you a lot of solvents, irrespective of how you put those fragments together. But the enzymatic process doesn't use any solvent at all, in, in theory. I mean, occasionally you add a little bit for solubility purposes, but otherwise it doesn't use, it's just aqueous solution. Yeah, and greening, greening a, um, a production process is also a matter of uh, money, of course. So you, you need to invest in developing that route. And so companies that have deeper pockets are more readily looking into, into this than companies smaller companies maybe that that are just focusing on on getting that ind or, or getting that phase one uh study through uh, they, they just want to have the compound uh, and 
start the study and prove yeah. that, that, that the compound is indeed active or not. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on companies right at the start when they're developing products, want to get it into the clinic and get the first results to, you know, just to, we just need the product. It doesn't matter how much it costs, how we're going to do it. We have to get it and test it. And because if it doesn't work, then we can stop and do something else. The yeah. real problem is if it does work, people then do not change the process, but go move forward to using the same technology. Yeah. What is but, it? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, that's okay. I was going to say, it, just, it, it sounds like part of the, the value I think that Peptolytes, you know, brings to the, the chemist um, could be speed of getting, because that, that seems, you know, when I was a, a chemist at the bench doing drug discovery, it was like, get the, get the molecules out, get the molecules out. And so it, it's like, if you put that time investment into just understanding how to use the technology, that it could actually really help you just get molecules out very quickly. Yeah, it has to become a tool. Yeah. It has to become a tool which you can, you know, you can use for right. several different processes. Yeah. It's just there. Yeah. If you want to try an enzyme, try it. If it doesn't work, you can do something else, but at least try it. And then, that's also why we now make the kit available. Uh, but um, so for a um, fortumer peptide, I think we also have to be honest. When you start a synthesizer, uh, that is almost always faster than making two fragments and ligating them together because overnight you have your fortumers at hand as crude as as it is but chemists are a lot interested in, in just getting the compound and test the compound and then move on to the next target well i think that goes back to the earlier point of where this fits in of, of accessibility of peptides mm -hmm. and in, in length and also in complexity yeah and now it is a, so now the, the kit is again available so companies could could order the kit and could test it and and could just incorporate it in their own development uh, schemes yeah absolutely what do you think um sort of i always i like to ask people to sort of put on their uh, prediction cap and think about the future what are you most excited about for nz tag um, and it could be like specific types of chemistry or just kind of the evolution of the company. Yeah, so um, I'm most excited about uh, synthesizing long peptides or small proteins um, with or without non-canonical amino acids. But of course, with non-canonical amino acids uh, is, is even better. Uh, but that is where we are uh, um, uh, focusing at right now and, and are having some successes and hopefully more successes uh, uh, in, in the future. So, and then size of, the, of the, um, the, the peptides or proteins you need to think about is elsewhere between 80 and 150 amino acids. So the ones where quite a bit of pharma companies are, are focusing at, uh, at the moment, um, where we ligate two or three long fragments together and get them a, a folded or non-folded uh, protein. Excellent. Okay, what am I looking forward yeah. to? Yep. The, first, the, the first approved pharmaceutical using enzymatic synthesis, that's a peptide pharmaceutical, yeah. yeah. Because I think that opens the floodgates. A lot of people holding back because they nobody's done this before. I mean, even people sort of say, well, you know, what's the FDA going to say about using enzymes? Well, I mean, enzymes are used in making so many other things. There's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be used in making polypeptides. So as I say, once, once we get one or two um, products, uh, peptide therapeutics or protein therapeutics that use this technology, I, I think all the inhibitions will disappear and we'll see a lot more people wanting to use them. You had mentioned something earlier that I didn't, I didn't realize that once a drug is approved, companies can go back and reevaluate their production. Oh, yeah, oh yes. I didn't can, know that. I thought it was kind well, of like... You have to re-register it. I mean, but the people will do that. I mean, I mean obviously, I mean, you've, you work for pharmaceutical companies right, and you, right. re you realize how how limiting regulatory processes are. It is really the case is that even if you have an existing process, which you don't intend to change, but you actually find that if you change certain parameters or you did reactions in a different order, you could get a much more economical and greener process, you're still not allowed to do it without re-registering. Right, 
Right. Yeah. I, just, I didn't I mean, realize that would be a common practice, yeah. or maybe I don't know how common it is. I don't think it's very common okay. that people, okay. uh, you know, redesign the manufacturing process, okay. but they're not. They're certainly not going to do it before they get right. get the product registered. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything? Oh, go ahead, Linda. Sorry, please. No, yeah. So, so after that, um, so once you have uh, launched your your product, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I I would be very interested in in having a conversation with big pharma company. What is the appetite to change the route uh, yeah. versus mm -hmm. just exploit the the current route and and treat patients? Just make your, make the compound available to to the patient because that is what is of course their ultimate goal and they have reached that goal and so in how far are they interested to start right away with filing a, a next generation route I, I i have no idea i think oh go ahead rodney no i just think it really depends on the size of the product mm -hmm. i mean you know no, nobody's going to change the process to earn a few thousand dollars more a year it's got it's got to be a really large amount uh, to actually incite you to to actually design a new process or to use a new process, mm -hmm. but there are going to be cases where that will happen. I mean, one of the things we do see in the peptide therapeutic world, um, and the reason why the numbers are going up so much, it's not really the new products. It's the fact that the scale of manufacture of some of these peptide therapeutics is getting much much bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, you know, as I've been speaking to people about the, especially the greening of, of peptide science and, and of science in general, uh, to me, you know, I see that, yes, we're making medicine for, for people and that's number one is to, to help treat disease. But if we're treating disease and then polluting the earth, they're, you know, these are like almost incompatible, right? It's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to help cure this illness, but then at the same time potentially cause another. And so I feel like there's a whole mindset that we, we all have to change globally um, at every level, at the patient level, at the doctor level, and at the, the discovery mm. development level. Well, uh, I mean, there's uh, quite an interesting paper um, which uh, NCPEP published together with another large uh, uh, peptide CMO, which was looking at the large-scale production of, um, of exen exenatide. And you really should look at the amount of solvent you need to make a kilogram of exenatide using different processes. I mean, you literally, you're talking about tons of solvent rather than, you know, multi-hundred liters. So an awful lot of solvent is used to produce uh, peptides when they're made in very large quantities. So, um, and it's not just that they're solvents. Some of these are very, really quite toxic solvents as well. So we really do need to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything um, that you wanted to bring up in particular? You know, I don't. I know some questions to ask, but what, what else is going on at uh, Enzatag? And I mean, Leonard, maybe you could say something about to these, you know, these parallel tracks that we have because we've only spoken really about uh, putting two peptide fragments together and making longer peptides up to now. Yeah, so I think I also would like to mention that the enzyme is available at large scale. So that scale is no limitation. It's not really uh, only small scale, but we can supply the, the enzymes in tens of grams of uh, uh, quantities to also support large scale GMP production. Um, so, so, so that is one thing uh, which is very important to cover in this interview. Uh, another important thing indeed is what Rodney brings up is that, yeah, we've very much focused on just ligating two peptide fragments together, but that can be done in a repetitive mode, of course, in order to, to grow small proteins, but we could also um, efficiently uh, produce uh, cyclic peptides um, and their scalability is particularly um, uh, of, of, of interest. So it's very interesting because um, we do have a very good uh, overview of the competing technologies uh, for making uh, these cyclic peptides, which is the classical um, solution phase um, cyclization, backbone cyclization or native chemical ligation. And to focus a bit on, on the classical solution phase cyclization, um, which is 
leads to quite a bit of byproducts, including resomization, uh, and it is hardly scalable uh, with native chemical ligation. Of course, you need to have a cysteine um, where, uh, where you could ligate at, or you need to uh, incorporate certain tricks in order to, to have a cysteine there and then remove it afterwards. But native chemical ligation, so far, we haven't seen any scaled process uh, using that technology. Uh, so it's very valuable at lab scale, but once you want to have a scalable route, you need to switch technologies. And that is what the peptide ligase technology offers. So from the very small scale in the lab, what you see in the, in, uh, in, in, in the back, where we do it at microgram scale quantities, you scale up right away to the, to the kg uh, quantities of, uh, of API under GMP um, with whatever CMO uh, of interest. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but I was thinking also that you, there is some uh, work going on in the medical chemistry area as well, so that we're not just treating the technology as a production technology, which was where we originally started, but also um, there are definitely certain aspects of it which can be used for discovery. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's also true. So. Um, we want to start as early as possible with a pharma company. So that means that we start typically in the, in the discovery where we work with discovery chemists and biologists uh, working on their compounds and showing that the technology works, making a library of compounds for screening purposes, and then they select a couple of leads that then move into preclinical and clinical work. Also, perhaps like to say that you know everything we've done up to now has really been directed towards the pharmaceutical industry. We've never really looked into biomaterials or no. um, uh, neutral chemicals or things like that. So, if anybody's listening to this podcast or uh, webcast and you know has an idea for polypeptide-based uh, uh, materials which might need. Uh, uh, specific enzymes to assemble the macromolecules, we'd be very interested in hearing about it because I say most of our, our focus has been entirely on, on pharmaceuticals. And we're very aware that even, you know, even in the electronics industry, there is some use for peptides, but we're not electrical engineers, unfortunately, maybe. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love the idea of partnering across industries. I think, again, it, that, mm -hmm. that's where innovation can happen, right? So, you know, perhaps um, we learn something from the, the electrical industry that actually translates back over to pharmaceutical and vice versa. So I think having that collaboration is a, a great idea and uh, mm -hmm. encourage folks to uh, reach out to you for sure. Thank you to Rodney and Lindert for your time. I, I do appreciate it. Yeah, I would like to, to thank uh, you for the opportunity for yep. yeah, having this interview with us and uh, uh, featuring Enzitag in your series. Okay. It's a very yep. pleasure. It's very kind of you to reach out to us. Oh, I, really, I appreciate your time, both of you. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's great to, to connect um, and globally. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. If you enjoyed the content, please like and share with your community. As always, we welcome your feedback as well as your suggestions for topics that you'd like to see covered. Thanks again for tuning in.